chronicled the life of a, a man named Adam Brown. He was from Hot Springs, Arkansas, uh, was, I don't know, kind of an ordinary kid, a high school football star. Uh, but as unfortunately, but often happens, uh, Adam Brown, after high school, he fell into a life of drugs and addiction. Uh, and while he had a good family that had supported him, been with him along the way, uh, he ultimately began to steal to feed his habit. And he, he began stealing from his family and his friends and pretty much anyone that he could take from he did. Uh, one day Adam looks up and he's standing before a judge facing 13 felony counts for his various crimes. And even though this wasn't his first appearance in court, uh, the judge gave him an opportunity to go to rehab. And of course, Brown took that, that opportunity and it was there in rehab that he recommitted his life to following Jesus. And, and, and Jesus began to do a powerful and transforming work in, in Adam's heart. And so he began the best he could serving the Lord, uh, he joined the Navy, uh, begins to pursue the, his dream of becoming a Navy SEAL. Uh, along the way, there were a lot of rough patches for him in a training accident. Uh, he was actually took a training around in his eye, lost, basically lost all of his vision in his dominant eye, but continued to push through. As a matter of fact, he taught himself to shoot uh, with his non-dominant eye, and he was so good that he actually passed... Um, Navy SEAL sniper school, uh, even with just the one eye. And then uh, he was in uh, Iraq, and uh, due to a roadside bomb, his Humvee was overturned, and his hand was crushed beneath the Humvee, his shooting hand, which would never regain dexterity. So he had to teach himself to shoot with his off hand. And he went on to enjoy like a, a, a long and significant career, a member of SEAL Team 6. He was a Navy SEAL. Uh, everything was great, and he was on his final deployment in Afghanistan, and he went out alongside his, his brothers in arms and his unit. Um, he went out into a difficult sector, a, a really difficult mission, and it was there on that particular mission that Adam Brown was shot, and he ended up dying from his wounds. And as his wife and his friends gathered to celebrate his life, they celeb celebrated several things about Adam Brown. It was his fierce determination he celebrated his bravery, his faith in Christ, and his love for others. Ultimately, they went on to celebrate Adam Brown, who, whose life was once a, once a wreck, but whom Jesus had saved. And he went on not only to live a good life, but also to offer his life as a sacrifice. Like he uh, laid down his life uh, in the call of duty um, on behalf of other people. Uh, just before his death, he'd written a letter to his young son, and he said to his son, I'm not afraid of anything that might happen to me on this earth because I know that no matter what, nothing can take my spirit from me. No matter what, my spirit is given to the Lord and I will finally be victorious. Adam Brown wasn't af afraid to give his life as an ultimate sacrifice because he knew where his true destination was. He knew that eternity hung in the balance for the men he served alongside with and he was willing to endure all that he went through in pursuit of Serving Jesus Christ with his life. In this series, it's been called This Is Us. We've just been attempting to pull back the curtain and let you see who we are as a church, who Cross Community Church is. In our first week, we said we are unapologetically biblical. In a culture that doesn't always appreciate biblical truth, we are committed. We preach from the Word. We will teach you what the Word of God has to say, and we're not going to compromise on that. We are unapologetically biblical. We also said that this is a church where it's okay to not be okay. It's just not okay to stay that way. Like Adam Brown, there was a time in his life where he was not okay. He was in the throes of addiction. And, and listen, if you look around, you're going to find people just like him here, people whose lives have been destroyed by sin, whose lives are a wreck. And listen, uh, we're glad. If that's you, we are glad that you are here because we just happen to know a Savior who specializes in sinners just like us. Uh, men and women who have gone off the rails, whose lives have, have come crashing down around us. And Jesus just delights in saving sinners just like us. So it's, it's okay. If you're not okay uh, here today, we're glad for that. Uh, but it's not okay to stay that way because Jesus has greater plans for your life, plans to give you a hope and a future that is beyond anything that you can ultimately imagine. We said here at Cross Community, uh, our goal is to make disciples and not converts. 
this morning we got to celebrate baptism, which is like crossing the starting line of this race of faith that we have to run in this life. Uh, but I want to be clear, baptism, salvation, a prayer of faith, whatever it might look like for you, is the starting line and not the finish. And as a church, we are committed not just to helping you uh, be converted, to come to faith in Jesus, but we want to, you to live out a robust life of faith in Jesus Christ where you live in the fullness of his power. You live out God's plan for you, that full and abundant life that he has. And so we, we are committed to making disciples and not just converts. And then last week we told you that we bet the farm on community. We believe that God created us in his image for life with other people. That God didn't create us to do life alone, but rather to live in deep, rich, abiding relationships with other believers who are as committed to us walking with Jesus as we are. And so I just want to let you know, um, at Cross Community, we are going to ask you, we are going to push you, we are going to encourage you to get into a community group where discipleship happens, where you can life on life grow in your faith in a relationship with Jesus Christ and with other people. Now today, it's our final value, and it's, it's one that takes a little bit more explanation. Our, our final core value is this. We sacrificially sinned for the sake of of the gospel. And what this means is that we are committed to sacrificially sending people and resources to people in places uh, that, that are in need, to, to people who don't yet know the gospel. And that might be across the street and it might be across an ocean, but we are committed to taking the gospel to people that need it. And so what I want to do for you today is just walk you through that statement. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. And I want to begin by talking about who we are. We sacrificially sin for the sake of the gospel. Look what John says in 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. He says, Beloved, these are believers in Jesus. When we talk about the we, that's who we're talking about. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Y'all, we don't manufacture love. Love is not a feeling we have when we, you know, first meet that special someone in our life and, you know, there's drool coming out of our mouth and we smile way too much. That's not love. Love comes from God, true divine love that God has called us to express to other people ultimately comes from Him. We cannot give to other people what we have not first receive, right? If we don't have something, we can't give it away. And so John is clear. Love is from God, and whoever has been born of God and knows God, verse 8, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And he's like, hey, just a second. Y'all, if you look at your life and you find that you are not living a life of love for God and for other people, something's wrong there. If you're not loving, it may be an indication that you have yet to receive this profound divine love from God, which will spill out of you on to other people. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. And he goes on, and he says this, Verse 9, in this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. When we talk about the we, we're talking about the church of Jesus Christ. We're talking about men and women who previously found ourselves dead in our trespasses and sins. Men and women who were hopeless and helpless to save ourselves. Uh, because we had sinned, we'd broken God's law we are lawbreakers, and once you've broken God's law, you can't undo what you've done. You can't do enough good deeds to somehow outweigh your bad deeds. We were hopeless and helpless to save ourselves. That's who we are. But Romans 5.8 tells us this, that God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. While I was still a sinner, Jesus died for me. He knew it, and yet he willingly went to the cross to die in my place. When we talk about the we, 
those who sacrificially sin for the sake of the gospel. We're talking about men and women who were hopeless and helpless to save ourselves, but who have been radically saved by this overwhelming love of God who saw us in our sin and chose to die for us anyway. We, 1 John 4, 19, it says, we now love because God first loved us. What is the motivation for sacrificially sinning for the sake of the gospel? And it's the love that God has shown to us, the love that was so profoundly undeserved on our part, and thus we begin to love other people like that. We love people who don't deserve it. We love people who may have wronged us. We love people that we may not have met. We love other people because we are emulating the love of God for us, the love of God that's been given to us. We now give to other people because we have first received it from God. So we, the second word in that statement we're going to look at is, is sinned. What do I mean by sinned? Well, first I want you to see the nature and character of God. Look, look with me again in verse 9. He says, in this the love of God was made manifest. You want to know what the love of God looked like for us? It was made manifest among us that God sent his only son, into the world. If you read on in the next verse, it says, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. If you look down in verse 13, By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And so what we see, the reason we are a sending people is because we have a sending God. The fact that God sent his son Jesus Christ changed everything for us. We were incapable of saving ourselves. We were dead in trespasses and sins. And by virtue of the fact that God loved us enough to send his son Jesus for us, we now get to live. Like it is, it is a pr profound thing in our lives that God sent his son Jesus. And it is profound that he didn't just like save us, okay, your attorney's secure, now you're on your own. God also sent his spirit to live in our hearts, to empower us to live victorious and abundant lives. Our God is a sending God. And as his children, we are a sending people. What we don't do is just like, oh, hey, you know, God, thanks for, thanks for saving me. Like, that's a real blessing. We want to praise God for that. But we don't stop there. Because we now have the love of God in us, we can't help but look outward at other people who are still dead in their trespasses and sins, who are slaves to sin and incapable of saving themselves. And so what we do as the people of God is we sinned. We recognize like two things for us. First, we are a sent people. And I want you to understand I'm going to say it more specifically for you. You are a sent person. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus was speaking to his disciples just before he had ascended into heaven and, and given them his Holy Spirit. And he, he tells them, hey, don't go, don't go out and try to be my witnesses yet. And don't try to convert the nations. Don't try to heal the sick. Like, just wait. But when the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive Power And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Jesus is like, hey, just wait and watch what God does through you when you receive the Holy Spirit. He calls them to be witnesses. In Matthew 28, 19 and 20, this is the Great Commission. Jesus says, hey, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now I want you to go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God has sent his Spirit that as we go out as sent people, those who would receive the commission as God's witnesses in the world, we don't go out in our own strength. We go out in the power of God's Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. It's God's Spirit that empowers us and is present with us as we seek to fulfill the Great Commission. As individuals, we are sent people. 
We are sent out to make disciples. And here's what I believe about you. That God has perfectly positioned you in your home, in your workplace, in your school, young people, in your neighborhood, in your circle of friends. God has perfectly positioned you and sent you there to be his witnesses to make disciples of all of the people that you're interacting with. You have been sent by God on this mission where he came to seek and to save that which was lost, where he came to give true and abundant and fullness of life. And we are his sent ones individually. But there is a collective part of that too. As a church, God has we, we collectively come together and we send out other people. And so we'll talk a little more later about what that looks like. But this is a commission as sending church. We are sent, and together we come together and send. And so we empower people to go to places that maybe God hasn't called us to go. We have the, the pleasure of sending missionaries and church planners to Madrid, where they're, they're working and they're sharing the gospel with people that, that don't yet know, people that I couldn't communicate with, people that, that need to hear the gospel. Like they're living there full time because collectively we come together to send them. But you know what? Sending can sometimes be costly. In the church of Antioch in Acts chapter 13, you know, I'm just telling you, this church had it going on. They had everything going for them. They were absolutely killing it. They're making disciples. Man, people are being encouraged and built up. In Acts chapter 13, we're told that the church, man, and things are great in Antioch. But they come together and they're praying and they're fasting. And the Holy Spirit says to them collectively as a church, hey, I want you to set aside for me Saul or Paul and Barnabas. Now, I don't know if you know the story about Paul. He's just the guy that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, right? He's the one that Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. Scales ended up falling from his eyes. He was an apostle of Jesus Christ, right? Man, to think that you had the apostle Paul in your church, like, that's a sermon you want to hear. Like, that's the Sunday you're not going to miss. You're not sleeping in. You're not watching. Like, I'm going to be there to listen to the apostle Paul preach. And there would have been people in the church at Antioch who remembered listening to the apostle Paul bring the gospel and they had been saved as a result of his preaching. It was profound. And then there was Barnabas. He's known as the son of encouragement. Man, he's the guy you would have wanted to spend time with. You would have looked forward every time to seeing him because Barnabas would have built you up. Man, he would have encouraged you. He's a guy that you want around. And yet the Holy Spirit said to the church at Antioch, hey, hey Antioch, this isn't about you. And you have been blessed with the gospel. But because you love other people, because God loves other people, I want you to set aside Paul and Barnabas. And I want you to send them out for the work that I've called them to. And if Antioch would have been like, mm -mm, not doing it. Man, we got a good thing going here. Like, don't mess up what we got happening in our church. And who knows what would have happened. I mean, the Apostle Paul is the one who began to spread the gospel to the Gentiles, the known world at the time. Barnabas continued on his missionary work as well. They even like diverged at one point, went on their own, their own ways, sharing the gospel. We likely sit here today as beneficiaries of the missionary work of Paul and Barnabas who were sent out by the church at Antioch. But listen, they would have missed those relationships and sending can be costly. And that's why we have the next word. We sin and we do so sacrificially. But we're a people who serve a God who sent sacrificially. You think about Jesus. I haven't been to heaven, but I've read about it in the Word. And heaven's a place you want to be, you know? Like, obviously, it's a good place. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. That while we were, we were still yet sinners, he sent his only son. In verse 11, God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And in this is love, not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Jesus Christ stepped down out of heaven 
and he took on the weakness of human flesh. From day one, he was persecuted. He was despised and rejected by men. He was betrayed by one of the twelve apostles and abandoned by all of the rest when he was arrested. He was falsely accused and beaten beyond recognition. He was placed on the cross and the nails were driven through his wrists and his ankles. And even as he hung there, he cried out, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. We serve a God who sacrificially sent his son that we might have life. There's a word here in this verse. It's the word propitiation. It's like a $5 seminary word, y'all. Just work it into your conversation next week. No one's going to know what it meant, but they're going to think you're smart, right? Propitiation, it it has kind of a picture of two different images that we see in the Old Testament. If you were a a good Jew, you you would kind of know how this worked. But in the Old Testament, under the the system of, of law, every year on the Day of Atonement, we know it as Yom Kippur, it's how the Jews practice it today. The Day of Atonement, all the people would gather together at the temple or the tabernacle. And they would come together on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and they would have to bring a couple of lambs with them. Maybe it was a goat, maybe it was a lamb, but they had to be pure, spotless lambs. And they would gather together, and they would bring one of the lambs to the priest, and he would place his hands on the head of that young lamb, that pure, spotless lamb. And he would begin to confess the sins of the people. Greed, lust, adultery unforgiveness, stealing, lying, murder. He would confess the sins over that little lamb. And there in front of all the people, the priest would slaughter that little lamb. Its blood would be shed. And the priest would take the blood of that lamb and he would enter into the Holy of Holies. And he would sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat. That first lamb was offered as an atonement. Its blood was shed so that the peoples didn't have to be. It received the punishment that the people deserved. It was an appeasement. And so that's one half of propitiation. But there was another lamb there on that day. They would bring it forward again, lay the hands on the head of that little lamb or that goat, confess the sins of the people, and they would take it way out in the wilderness They would send it away to never be seen again. So on the one hand, the first lamb would appease the wrath of God for sins. It was an atoning sacrifice, if you will. And the other was the one where the sins were taken away. And what Jesus Christ did for us by becoming a propitiation, he was the sacrificial lamb. He died to endure the punishment that you and I deserved. He was our atoning sacrifice. He stood in our place. And there on the cross, God took the sins of every one of us who would trust not in ourselves, not in our own goodness, but trust in the sacrificial death of Jesus. God took all of our sins and he placed them on his son. Jesus took them away from us. And God credited the perfect, righteous life of Jesus to our account. Jesus is our propitiation, but it was very costly. If you would have stood in the crowd on the Day of Atonement and you watched that little lamb be slaughtered, you watched it bleed, you would have had the sense that our sins matter. They were costly. We are a people who have received the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus has taken our sins away. Why do we sacrificially sin? Because that's what God did for us. And that's the way that Jesus loved us. And if God's love now lives within our hearts, do you know what we do? Listen, we don't live distracted lives pursuing the empty things of this world. 
our hope and our goal in this life isn't to have the most athletic and successful kids or careers or any other thing. Our hope in this life, because we have been filled with the love of God, the self-sacrificing love of God, our hope is that other people may know the joy that we found in Jesus. They might find the forgiveness that we found in Him, that their lives may be transformed as our lives have been transformed. And so we sacrificially sin for the sake of the gospel. That's who we've been called to be as a church. And it's costly sometimes. Listen, there will be moments when we're living as witnesses for Jesus Christ, when we're seeking to make disciples, where things are going to get a little uncomfortable. And if you're surprised by that, you haven't been reading the Word. And it was uncomfortable for Jesus. His sacrificial death was extraordinarily painful. And the invitation of Jesus wasn't to pray a prayer and walk an aisle. It was to follow him. And so that's what we do. We live as sent ones. And in our homes, dads, we understand that we are there to make disciples. That's your primary purpose. Where That's your primary place where you make disciples. And so I don't know what it's been looking like for you, but dads, maybe for the first time when you leave here today, you just gather up your little family and be like, hey, I don't know where else to start, but I'm going to start. We're going to pray together. And I might feel a little bit awkward about that, but Jesus died for me. I, I, can, I can pray for you. And maybe as you begin a time of reading the word together, you just gather your wife. Let's pray together. And it doesn't stop in your home. But you are sacrificially sent to your work or kids at school. And it may be a little awkward for you to have gospel conversations. And you may not be the most popular person. But I promise you, one day when you look back on any sacrifice that you make for the sake of the gospel, you will look back and you will never regret the sacrifice that you made. You will look back with gratitude in your life that you got to be a part of what God was ultimately doing in and through you. It's his power and not ours. Collectively as a church, I mean, we sacrifice individually. And I hear the stories all the time. Like, I mean, I praise God for that. But collectively as a church, man, we sacrifice together. We give a lot of money here. Joey's going to cover that just a little bit later. We support our local schools. we got volunteers that are going. They're leading campus clubs. They're sharing the gospel in our schools. We support Recovery Ranch or 633 through our coffee bar. Drink more coffee because we get to support more missions, right? Uh, we support Second Chances, which helps people with food and clothing and recovery and all sorts of things in our community. We support the Care Portal which is a partnership between state and nonprofits where we get to help families who are standing in the gap on behalf of fathers, foster kids. We help provide beds and clothes and whatever those kids may need. They know that they're loved by the church of Jesus Christ. Maybe if they don't even walk through our doors, they know that someone cared enough to provide a bed for them or clothing for them. Praise God, we get to sacrifice for the sake of the gospel. We support Samaritan's Kitchen, which just feeds a meal every single week to people in our community who may be without we support Devin Huddleston on the campus of the University of Central Oklahoma where she works for Stumo and she's making disciples there. She's sharing the gospel and teaching young people how to follow Jesus. We support Rhonda Baxter who ministers in our, the European theater. She is a kind of a, a missionary to missionaries where she's encouraging them and building them up and, and just walking with them through the struggles. She's now also working in, in Africa. We support Donnie and Rachel Todd, who are working all over the world to raise up missionaries from people in all nations to go to very difficult places um, where it's hard to get the gospel in. We support the Grizzles, who minister in North Africa to Muslims in a closed country where we have to be careful how we even talk about them. And we have the privilege of supporting so many missionaries. We sacrificially sin for the sake of the gospel. Listen, there are some things we don't get to do ministry-wise here because of what we're doing there. But I'd gladly do it any day. And that's what Jesus has done for us. God sacrificially sent his son. We sacrificially send other people, and we do it for the sake of the gospel. Listen, we can't save anybody. You can't save anybody. It's not going to happen. I can't save anybody. But Romans 1.16 tells us this. 
Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And so what we do is we leave this place, we share the gospel, and we send out other people to share the gospel to other places that we're not called to, we're not going, but we sacrificially send that people might come to know Jesus Christ and be saved by him. And so for you and for me, I have just three things that I want you to consider. As you seek to live this out in your life, Point number one, would you embrace your sentness? Would you just receive this call of God on your life? Listen, it's not for the person that's sitting next to you in the pew or the person who's on the payroll of the church. This is for you. You have been sent by Jesus Christ to take the gospel, to be a witness in your circle, in your group of friends, in your home And would you just receive this commission from Jesus to go and make disciples there, knowing that you are empowered by his Holy Spirit? Would you go home and have a gospel conversation with your kids? And show up at work tomorrow and begin to love people as Jesus has loved you? Would you sacrificially serve them, share with them, endure the discomfort of an awkward gospel conversation? We're not ashamed of the gospel, and it's the power of God who saves, who came to seek and to save that which was lost. Number two, I want to invite you to partner with us as we send together. First and foremost, this looks like you praying. Would you pray for us that when we leave this place, we don't take off our church hat, but instead we keep it on and we go and we live as the church all day, every day. And when we hit the restaurant after the service is over, And we're there to make disciples. We're there to be his witnesses. And when we go to work and wherever we might be, pray for the church to not be ashamed of the gospel. Would you pray for our missionaries that we've sent out? Man, they're all over the coffee bar. If you want to know who they are, what they're doing, you'll get information there that you can't get from the pulpit here. Pray for those people who are serving in difficult places. Would you continue to give sacrificially? And we're going to get to celebrate some numbers in just a little bit about how this church has given sacrificially, but would you just continue to do that? Man, if you have not joined us in that, would you consider saying, hey God, I know that you haven't given me all this money just for me. We are the richest nation in the history of the world. I know there's inflation, milk is expensive, right? I got kids, I know. But would you sacrifice for the sake of the gospel in your giving with us? And then the final thing, and again, this is for you, not for the person next to you. Would you prayerfully consider whether God is calling you to go to other people in other places? We've all been sent, but sometimes God sets aside the Pauls and the Barnabases and says, hey, I want you to go. I want you to set them aside for the mission that I've called them to. Maybe for you, God has uniquely called you to minister in a cross-cultural way. Maybe it's in a country that isn't open to the gospel. Maybe it's across an ocean. Maybe it's just across the state. I don't know, but would you prayerfully consider what God may be calling you to? And whatever that looks like, would you just say yes to him? And it would be our joy as a church to collectively partner in sending you for the sake of the gospel. Would you bow with me? Lord Jesus, we're thankful for your sacrificial death for us. We are thankful for the cross. We are thankful that you took our sins and credited to us your righteousness. We are thankful for the life that we have in you. For God, we're thankful for the love that you showed to us. And I pray that as the people of God, we would now love you and love other people sacrificially. God, we love you. We praise you. And we ask that you would have your way in this place. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.